I'm Jim. And I'm Garrett. And this is... Jim, Jim and Garrett, Garrett at the movies. movies. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Jim and Garrett at the Movies. Today, we are going to be reviewing the new film, uh, the sort of Bruce Springsteen fan film <laughs> of sorts uh, called Blinded by the Light. Uh, we'll be pairing that with the commitments and also some announcements out of the big Disney Expo D23. So let's start with Blinded by the Light. This is directed uh, by Gurinder Chadra, Chada. I'm sorry, I mispronounced that name. Uh, it is directed by the uh, the director of Bend It by Beckham, and it stars Vivek Kalra as a uh, young writing student in Margaret Thatcher's Britain, 1987, who becomes obsessed with Bruce Springsteen and uh, Bruce Springsteen's songs. He is joined on his journey by a, uh, a another a Sikh friend who also enjoys Springsteen and a a girlfriend and a friend who's who's the leader of a band and all oppressed by a rather uh, disappointed father. Um, so what did you think of it? I actually, before I, before I sort of transfer this to you, I want to, I want to note one thing that you mentioned about this movie, even before we watched it, Garrett. And that was that, uh, you know, you said that you're not much of a Bruce Springsteen fan, but you know what it's like to fall in love with music. And so you hope that this film would capture that, uh, that process. Did this film capture, capture that process for you? Blinded by the Light is the best film I have seen so far this year. Holy shit. Bottom line. I was absolutely love this movie. I thought it succeeded at everything it attempted to do. Uh, and what it attempted to do was interesting. It was emotional. It, it, it touched on everything from just the joy of music and friends to, to the echoes between politics in the 1980s and, uh, and today to, to race and religious relations. Um, uh, and as the, you know, the trailer sort of sold what, it, and as you echoed back at me, what it means to fall in love with music. Now, I want to be clear. I don't, I, I don't have anything against Bruce Springsteen. I respect the man. You know, I like several of his songs, but I'm certainly would not consider myself like a fan. I, you know, if, if, if he came to town, I wouldn't be lining up to see him in, in, in concert. If he was playing Bonnaroo and we were there, I'd totally go see him. But, uh, uh, that's not the relationship I have with Bruce. Um, but uh, there's just so much that I felt in this film. Uh, I, I, it, 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 I went through this. You know, I mean, obviously not exactly this. I, there's, there's a lot many differences uh, between uh, um, uh, Javed, the main character in this film, and the younger version of me, uh, which don't need to be belabored because they're rather obvious. Um, but, but the, the, the unifying human experience of falling in love with music uh, uh, ran right through me. Um, and so, yeah, 100% success on this film. I thought it was phenomenal. Wow. That is, uh, that's, that's refreshing to hear. I mean, not refreshing, but certainly encouraging to hear. I'm very happy to hear that. Um, I mean, the film worked for me as well. It didn't, I can't tell you that I, I had the same reaction that you did. It's not, for me, I think Midsummer still is the uh, the movie to beat so far this year. But uh, it's it, it worked for me as well. Um, I like a lot of the things that you mentioned. Um, I think the performances are fantastic. I think that there are moments where this film just has charm out the wazoo. It's just, it's fun as fuck. There is a moment when it's doing, uh, they're, they're doing a born to run sequence that is just wonderful. It's really just a delightful, uh, sequence. There are moments when this movie just goes all out music video. And, uh, I think if, you are willing to sort of join in that journey and just let the movie be a music video for a little while, then you're going to enjoy that. Um, and then, then this film overall will work for you. But if you were, if you find those, those sequences to be uh, distracting from the plot or distracting from the characters in any way, then I think that they, you're going to find a lot to dislike about this film. Clearly, you didn't have that reaction during those moments. And 
there's another moment with uh, Thunder Road, which is uh, also kind of defies the traditional verisimilitude of a film, and yet still, I that sequence ended up working for me, partially because I love that song, and partially because I think this film just has charm and heart of the wazoo. I really, it, it worked for me by and large as well. So probably not as much as you, but I think this is going to be two recommends. So let, let's take a step back now uh, and say, obviously, this is a film for fans, not only of film, but fans of music. You know, I, I, I'm sort of seeing this as capping off almost a year of movies about music. You know, it sort of began, and technically, sort of, I guess, was the end of last year, but with Bohemian Rhapsody, and then we had Rocket Man, and then we had Yesterday, and now we had Blinded by the Light. So, you know, Queen, Elton John, The Beatles, and now Bruce Springsteen, all these sort of classic uh, rock icons sort of getting their, their film... Uh, 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 approaches, but all these films, I think, you know, had interesting and different perspectives on on music. Uh, you know, whereas uh, Bohemian Rhapsody is sort of your traditional rock biopic. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Rocket Man was more sort of a, a musical, incorporating Elton John's music. Um, Yesterday was sort of a piece of magical realism uh, uh, involving the, the the significance of the Beatles' music uh, uh, in in world culture. And Blinded by the Light is a film about what it means to be a fan of music, not not a person creating music, but a person finding themselves in music, a teenager uh, searching for their place in the world, searching for their voice, uh, and and finding it in someone who you know it comes from uh, all the way on the other side of the world from completely different cultures. I mean, it's, it's, it's part of what made this story on the surface so interesting is that you have you know a a Pakistani Pakistani immigrant to England listening to music by an American rock star. Uh, uh, the, it, it's cutting across three separate cultures in one film, but sort of showing the unifying things that connect all of them together. Uh, uh, and that's a testimony in many ways, I think, to the universality of Bruce Springsteen's music. Um, but also, I think more broadly speaking, it shows how human beings across literal oceans and, and, and sometimes centuries even, if we want to go that far, uh, uh, can touch one another with the power of their creative uh, uh, craft um, through, through making music that, that, that ties us all together. Part of what stood out again by blinded uh, about blinded by the light for me is 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 that the character uh, you know the, the the characters but most notably uh, the, the the principal character Javed uh, wasn't trying to become a musician himself you know, you know it, 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 a more traditional film I think would have had him pick up a guitar and try to learn how to play and I, I'm not saying that film couldn't have been good but that film has been done before I really like that this wasn't about music inspiring a musician it was about music inspiring someone uh, to 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 find their own sort of existential place in the world, uh, 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 who who they want to be and what they want to do and how they relate to their, their family members and how they relate to their community. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's also, uh, I think, important to stress how much of a role is played by the lyrics, uh, by Bruce Springsteen's lyrics in this film. And there's several scenes when the lyrics are sort of projected either around his head or up against the wall and so forth. Um, one of the things which sort of disappointed me about the uh, 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 both Rocket Man uh, and, uh, to a lesser extent, Bohemian Rhapsody, is I, I didn't get the sense of precisely what the music meant to the people. It, it seemed like the music was there because everyone knew it, and they were trying to tell the the the, the story of the person. Um, you know, I I, I didn't quite. I, quite get what the uh, Elton John's music meant to Elton John out of Rocket Man. I saw his struggles and his story and that's interesting, but the music wasn't sort of you know, well it was a way of telling that story. It wasn't something that was was being told about. Uh, this is a story about how much the poetry and the uh, and the meaning of lyrics can transform the way a person feels. Uh, I, I I feel I felt like I got to know Bruce Springsteen a hell of a lot better through this film uh, than I did then I got to know Elton John through Rocket Man, even though this film is not technically speaking the story of Bruce Springsteen. Uh, um, and, and again, that's to a certain degree that, that, uh, a reflection on Springsteen's songwriting and his style, but also about how this movie is trying to tell us about what music can do for us. I Yeah, I think you nail it. I think uh, you have got to the heart of this movie. Let's also talk about one of the things that you mentioned in your opening, and that is the political overtones of this film. Uh, this is deliberately set in 1987 in Thatcher's Britain, um, and there's some obvious parallels between that time and our own. We get this one... I, there's a really brilliant shot after a 
uh, scene in a street. And it's Javed standing, and behind him is a picture of Thatcher. Um, and I'm not going to go... I'm not going to describe that picture too much, but that shot is absolutely brilliant. And it hammers home a political criticism of the struggles that current day Western civilization is having with white supremacy, the rise of white white supremacy, and how that sort of mirrors some of the uh, issues that were going on in 87 Britain at the same time. That said, those political overtones undertones rather those political undertones worked for me because they were subtle this isn't a this is not a movie about politics this isn't a to quote uh commenters on our sister channel deadly analysis this isn't an sjw movie um but it is certainly a film that is very assured of its politics and has something to say about our current political system or current political climate i should say and I really liked the way that the, the the music intertwined in this, not just in the sense of the music has a political message, although Bruce Springsteen's music certainly does have a political message, but rather how the characters used the music to express themselves, to deal with their problems. There's a particular scene, which I'm not going to spoil, but I was speaking generalities, where it looks like something is going to come to violence, where, 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 where there's going to be a, a violent confrontation between characters, but instead the characters break out in song, and they use the music to diffuse the tension. <laughs> and it's perfect. I mean, it, it's, 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 I suppose in some ways, you know, if you wanted to criticize it, you might say it's a little wish fulfillment right? That uh, 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 it's, the sort of, it's a sort of fantasy that lots of people have about how we wish we could handle confrontations like that. But I thought it was executed well enough to be plausible and believable. It didn't feel, I mean, again, certain parts of it are a little fantastic. As you, but that part felt actually quite realistic. Um, and you walk away smiling because while it's not as satisfying as seeing the, 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 you know, the bad guy get punched in the face, you see how it is that the music is transforming the character and giving them strength and giving them identity and purpose. Um, uh, and it, it's, it's so much of what art can do for us. You know, it, it's... It's something that sort of draws your attention to to how how vivid the world becomes when you discover great art, and how how you feel alive and you see yourself and your place in the world in a way that you never imagined possible. I remember when that happened to me. I remember the first time I really heard music. You know, I mean, so it had always been there, you know, but it wasn't until I, you know, in, in the beginning of the, the film, he's, uh, Javid is talking about other musical artists, but you can tell it's sort of just like, you know, more of a passing fat, uh, trend, as it were, it isn't something that really resonates with him in the way that Bruce resonates with him. And, and, and yeah, it's, it's just so humanistic and so powerful and, and, uh, and so uplifting uh, to see that it, it, can, uh, it can connect uh, across cultures in this way. Uh, I want to, you know, I just want to listen to you talk about this movie for an hour and a half. I, 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 I haven't seen you this delighted for a, with a film in quite some time. I'm glad to hear you say that because I was afraid I may be rambling on. But I, I do want to maybe hand it back to you and say, ask you, or, or, do you want to address or can you address or share your thoughts on the relationship between Javed and Javed's father in the film? Because that's obviously a crucial uh, uh, element of the story. Well, that's an element of the story that I think. Um, works sometimes and doesn't work other times. Uh, so for me, and, you know, this, this might get into, this might be a nice segue into some of my criticisms of the film, because I do think that I'm going to be a little bit lower in my star rating, although I'm still going to recommend it, uh, than you are. And that is because he, I think Javed's father has enough moments where he is humanized and he is not this arch villain and this kind of arch character that's like, no, you should be doing, you should be a lawyer instead of a writer. And like, because we've seen that character before, what this movie does well is it gives him enough moments where you can understand his point of view to the point that his admonitions of his son make some degree of sense. That said, that conflict resolves way too quickly and way too patly, uh, and it gets to one of my overall criticisms with this movie, is that there's a lot 
and it's just this movie is extra um there's a moment when the, there's sort of a second act turn with the principal romantic relationship and that uh that second act turn does not work for me in any way it's not motivated by uh the character in that moment of the story and i didn't i didn't buy that um that that turn um there's another character that's a a uh, best friend uh at the beginning of the film and then he sort of there's a conflict which obviously i won't go into but then that conflict gets resolved way too patly and way too quickly and he the movie forgets that he exists for quite some time and then oh, oh yeah he's still he's in the movie again um and there's a and and so that doesn't work. There's even a moment where that friend character, and this is minor minor spoilers, um, but he says, uh, "I've got problems with my father too." And the the issue with that is what he says is it complete is in complete odds with what we see of his relationship with his father. So if they're trying to draw a foil relationship there, it didn't work because they're showing us one thing but telling us another thing. And that's that's a problem. Um, it, yeah, so there's... I have some issues with the plot. I have some issues with some of the ways that the character conflicts resolve. And um, it, so those are my... Those are the things that bring it down for me. Some of those criticisms seem fair. De I, I definitely could imagine the, the the conflict with the father being resolved more artfully, uh, more more gracefully, uh, either or perhaps more gradually or more sort of powerfully if there was uh, a, a, a a tighter management of the final scene when uh, when the bridge is is reconstructed there. Um, and yeah, I, I did notice your point about the friends sort of, sort of disappearing for a good chunk of the film. Um, uh, somewhat of a maybe a structural I issue going on there. Uh, that having been said, uh, I I want to again echo back what you said because I was thinking the exact same thing. Is I think they did a good job of not making the father out to be a, 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 a an obvious bad guy, um, uh, of giving a good amount of his perspective, um, uh, his feelings of you know uh, being humiliated by not being able. You know, he gets fired uh, 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 fairly early on in the film. Um, and and ha the effect that has on him, uh, the difficulty ha he has in sort of uh, holding his family together, uh, being in a foreign land. There's been you know, several times where he talks about the fact, you know, he tells Javed, you will never be British. You know, you are a Pakistani. Um, uh, and that's sort of underscored by references to, to Margaret Thatcher and Enoch Powell and so forth. Um, and, you know, again, I've, I've never been an, uh, an immigrant living for a significant period of time outside my own country, much less one where the color of my skin made me an outcast. Um, but I think it did an incredible job of, of conveying what that must sort of feel like and how difficult that must be to sort of to be outside a culture um, and trying to, 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 to not let your family slip away into the, 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 the alien ways of this other place. Um, you know, you can, it's, it's a fairly common story, right? You know, uh, uh, first generation immigrants tend to stay fairly close to their original culture, but their children often what will be uh, more incorporate the culture uh, that they've, uh, they've adopted as their own. And, and that's, that, that, that's a difficult thing to go through. And I think the film does a great job of, of, of telling that story too, even though it's sort of a, you know, a B plot as it were. Um, uh, it, it had me reflecting on what it would be like if I moved my family to a different country and I was watching my son slowly become, you know, go, go native, as it were, and how difficult that might be if he didn't share my love of music, you know, or, or, or a love of my own culture, and instead he wanted to plug into this, what would be to me a foreign and alien culture, and yeah, that would be, could be hurtful and painful. And I, I, I felt... Is and what is odd, which, uh, I mean, I think you're right, but what complicates that is he's not just plugging into British culture, he's plugging into American culture, which isn't even the culture of the place that he's living in. Right. And even the, even the British characters uh, who, who are sort of native to uh, Luton, where, where he's, he's living, they, to some degree, reject Bruce Springsteen, uh, with the exception of the, uh, the Sikh friend that, uh, that he... Yeah, they, that also enjoys uh, Springsteen as much as he does. Roops so it's is the character's it, name. What's that? Thank Roops you. Roops is the character's name. You, thank you. Um, but that's that's an. I mean, it further complicates everything that you're saying. 
which is and, and the fact that the film is trying to juggle all of these things makes the degree of difficulty higher i just don't think it landed everything i feel like i'm criticizing this movie too much even though i had a ton of fun while watching it no and yeah and other complications you know, again they they are they're they're muslims in a predominantly non-muslim culture uh you know his his close friend is a sikh and and the, there's several moments where where the father keeps assuming that Bruce Springsteen is Jewish because of the last name, even though uh, uh, Javed has to keep continually correct him, he's not Jewish. And it, it's interesting because you know, there's never sort of any particular sort of overtly hostile anti-Semitism. You never get the sense that there's there, there's contempt for his being Jewish. It's just sort of the the ignorance that that leads him to assume anyone with a last name like Steen must be Jewish. Right. Uh, and right. so, so it, it, there, it, there are these sort of subtle layers of even you know you see the sort of you know the, the the, the, the subtle bigotry uh, a, a, in his own mind as well, um, and yeah, again, it's it's layered, it's nuanced, it's interesting, it's real. Um, you know, I, I did find myself wondering how uh, true to the true story the the film was because you know it it, uh, it did say at the beginning inspired by a true story, and you know, that the language they use there's always sort of finicky. Is it based on a true story? Inspired by true? how many liberties are they taking? Um, uh, but it, it's it, you know there obviously is at least an element of truth. This this is. To, to one degree or another, a true story, and that also, I think, makes it more powerful. If this is work, entirely a work of fiction, again, you might sort of uh, be accusing it a little bit more of, of sort of wish fulfillment or fanboyism, um, uh, but when, when, it's, when it's real, you sort of go, wow, yeah, this, this, is, this is what it is like when you find music that you love. It really is. So do you want to go ahead and uh, start? Yeah, no, I... Uh, um, I, I'm very reserved to, 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 to give a film five stars. That's not something I do commonly. Um, I, I was wondering if you might talk me down. And again, I, I will acknowledge some of the criticisms that you've, you've made as, as fair, uh, but, but it's, not, it's, it's not enough to knock it down for me. Five stars. This is first five-star film I've seen in a very long time. Very good. I'm, you know, I don't want to knock it down for you because I had fun watching it. I just couldn't turn away from some of the uh, structural issues. And so I'm giving it three and a half. Uh, but that's a high three and a half. I mean, I could probably convince be convinced into four, but I think three and a half is pretty fair for some of the issues that, that I noticed. Um, but yeah, once again, I had a ton of fun watching this movie. And uh, part of that has to do with the fact that I'm a pretty big bruce springsteen fan he's kind of on my uh my musical bucket list uh if he ever came within within reach i'd probably uh jump into a bruce springsteen concert but um all right so let's move on from bruce springsteen to soul music uh this is the commitments uh directed by alan parker coming out in 1991 this is the story of a group of irish singers irish uh you know Irish singers and a their manager, played by Robert Arkins, uh, who try to sing soul music in Ireland. Um, they the plot is fairly basic. It goes through the uh, the basic you know forming of the band, rehearsing the band, early success of the band, and then of course the breakup of the band. Um, what did you think of this movie, and how do you compare it to Blinded by the Light? Um, again, in the, in the, obviously this isn't a recent film, but I think it does sort of round out what I was saying earlier about being different perspectives on music, you know, where, whereas we, we've had the story of the, uh, you know, the sort of the, the singer, or we've had the, the musical version, we've had, uh, the, the, the fan version, uh, we've had the sig cultural significance of the music. This is a story told from the point of view of managing a band, you know, the Jimmy Rabbit, the main character is the manager of the band and he's sort of trying to sort of hold everything together. It's cl clearly his story. Um, and that's, that's another interesting perspective. That's not a typical perspective you think of, you know, when you think of, of bands and musicians and rock and roll and so forth, you typically think about, uh, uh the, the, the artists themselves. You don't think about the people who are working behind the scenes to, to do promotion and organization and all that stuff. Um, even though I'm sure many, many, many successful famous musicians will tell you that they would have gotten nowhere without their managers or their, their agents, their promoters and so forth. So, so it, it's a fresh perspective. That's interesting. It's also interesting because you know, when I, the first time I saw this music, I, 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 I was not particularly interested in soul music as such. 
Um, I have gradually sort of come around to it since since I first saw it, and now I, I have a deeper appreciation for soul music. Uh, so so that's uh, uh, it was interesting watching it uh, again after after so many years and sort of watching how my own musical tastes have developed. Um, and uh, uh, it's also interesting because it's it's decidedly Irish. This is a very Irish film. Uh, you know, in fact, I, I I kind of wonder if if some Irish people might feel a little offended that it sort of plays into so many Irish stereotypes. But clearly, it's it, it, it's an Irish film made by Irish people. So if anyone has the right to make a film that in some way sort of draws attention to these sort of stereotypical Irish character traits, it's got to be the Irish themselves. <laughs> uh, so uh, that yeah, that makes it for a really interesting brew, a really interesting mix. I do have some criticisms but maybe I'll, I'll hold off on those until a little later uh i, I want you to tell tell us what you thought of the film i think uh yeah i think that both blinded by the light and the commitments do one thing really well and that is it's it, it, it they both portray this sort of backdrop of uh, difficulty and hardship and how music or artistic expression of any kind, uh, music in, in the commitments, music and writing in uh, Blinded by the Light, work to ameliorate some of the difficulties associated with growing up in that back, in, in the backdrop of these, these difficulties. We've got uh, 87 Thatcher uh, regime in in Blinded by the Light, and here we have many shots of um, poverty and, um, you know, d crude and mean behavior uh, among the, the the residents of this, this Dublin area. And so I think that this film and Blinded by the Light both work as celebrations of art, as a restorative and... Um, refuge uh power for for the people who participate in them and that is the thing that i glommed onto the most in this movie i think specifically of the scene between uh jimmy and um bernie played by Bronna gallagher and uh he is trying to convince her going to go back to the band she's missed a couple rehearsals and there she is sitting in this rather squalid apartment with a lot of work to do a child to take care of and she says something along the lines of i need this band as much as anybody and you can tell why because it's on stage that she feels alive and it's here where the day-to-day -day humdrum of of um existing is bringing her down and i think that's a brilliant uh, a brilliant point about the restorative nature of art and artistic expression and so i that's what i i like the most about this movie um i think that there are some i think it's same thing with blinded by the light this movie has charm for days it is just delightful in many many parts but there's also a sense of realism and a sense of difficulty that is the, that serves as a poignant backdrop for this movie yeah the 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 idea of you know sort of the working class roots of both bruce springsteen's music and soul music is something that that is definitely common dna for both mm -hmm. of these films um and uh, yeah, I, uh, uh, I, I, I have difficulty in some ways sort of uh, uh, t taking apart here my own sort of general thoughts on the nature of music and how they, they, it ties into this film, uh, which is a function of the music and which is a function of the, of the, of the film. So I'm, I'm going to use a phrase here that's never used in the film. Uh, it is, I think, it's a, in some ways a pejorative phrase, uh, a marginalizing phrase, uh, as a phrase that's... Um, I know in my mind is not complimentary, but I think it's appropriate for the commitments as a band. They're a cover band. You know, they, sure. they play other people's music. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with that, of course. Obviously, you know, you, you can make great music by simply reinterpreting other people's songs. Many of the great performing artists throughout history have not written their own songs. Uh, so I, 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 again, I'm using the phrase cover band here again with reservations. I'm qualifying it because I don't want to make it seem like I think that that's something inherently wrong or inherently bad. Um, I think it's an accurate description of the things that happen in the movie. Yeah. 
at, at the same time, and again, I think this probably speaks more to my personal musical tastes rather than any flaws of the film or of the music. But for me, again, I think a lot of the power of music comes from what you saw in Blinded by the Light, where you see Bruce Springsteen expressing himself through his own uh, sort of not, not interpretive work, but through creative work. Um, I, I suppose part of me wanted to see the commitments try to write some of their own songs, try to do something uh, that was original rather than simply reinterpreting other artists' work. Now, that would have taken the film in a different direction. It would have been a challenge. It would have had, you know, how much time do you spend on uh, exploring the creative process rather than what they chose to focus on instead. Uh, so, again, I have ambivalent feelings about this. Um, uh, but at the same time, you know, I I find myself, like I was saying about Rocket Man. I'm not... In, I, I, I know what performing means to these people. I, I know what they get out of being on stage together and working together to create music and, and the, the love they get from the crowd and so forth. That is abundantly clear. What's not clear to me is why this music in particular means something to me. I mean, Jimmy in the beginning of the film sort of pull, almost pulls soul out of out of the air. Not, I mean, he, it, he loves it. It matters to him. But the actual musicians are recruited not so much because they love soul, but just because they want to be in a band. And again, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be in a band, but I, I have some difficulty for most of the characters seeing what, what it is about soul that moves them as opposed to jazz or rock or any no, uh, other genre which they may have ended up being a part of. Well, I mean, I think you're being a little unfair to the movie because there are those scenes when the film, like his first question to each of these characters is, who are your influences? And as soon as they say something like flock of seagulls or whatever, it's it's over, you know, or or I forget the actual bands that they mentioned. Um, right. Some of them were uh, uh, like punk bands that were popular during the time. But it, those those people got the doors shut in them. Uh, one can Several members of the band, though, were recruited sort of sight unseen just because they had talent or in the case of the backup singers, because they needed female singers. Um, right. uh, uh, and you know, they, they weren't those the singers, all four of the singers in the band were not asked the question, who were your influences? Yeah, that's uh, and that may, you're you're correct there. Um, but I think that there's. So he he is. I think the film is trying to suggest that there's something about soul that is um, resonant with this working class Irish community. We even get that moment, which I not particular. I don't particularly like this this line in the film, but uh, they we are the black people of britain and i you know I, it's not a line that i particularly like about the movie and then there's a moment later when a character says i'm black and i'm prude and he's not like that's not no i it's mean that's sort for of cringe, a, though. it is played for cringe it's it is <laughs> it's played for cringe it's played for humor um i get it but you know that doesn't mean i like it uh, that said, like I think that that is where the movie is trying to address your concerns. Whether or not those concerns were adequately addressed by those scenes is sort of a different question, but it is trying to deal with that. And to your earlier point, you see what this, these people get out of performing. This is a movie about performing. It's not a movie about the creation of music. It's a movie about the expression of music and the expression of an artistic endeavor that these people go on that they are able to share and garner some success for. So I think that it's, it, that's why I'm saying that your criticisms are slightly unfair to the movie. I understand them and I'm not, you know, I'm not totally shitting on the things you're saying about the movie, but I think that the film does address some of the things you're saying. The question is, is whether or not it addresses it in a satisfactory manner for you. And I can understand if your answer to that question is no. Yeah, like I say, you know, a, a large part of this is how I personally relate to music, and that is something I think which can be decoupled from the assessment of the film on its own merits. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I suppose, I mean, you know, this, this, that says a lot about me. For for me, I've always thought that the the, the better side of music is more the writing than the performing, as it were. Um, th th uh, there's something to me. 
uh, more noble about a band that keeps putting out albums, even if those albums aren't selling, uh, when they could just be touring the world, uh, uh, playing their old hits and so forth. I always thought there's something sort of more art an artistically pure or a certain kind of integrity to a band uh, uh, that, that writes because they want to write, not just because they want to sell records or they want to sell concert tickets. Sure. So uh, are you ready to close up? What sure. Okay. Would you say, would you give it? I give it uh, three and a half out of five. That's where I am as well. Yeah. Um, although this is uh, our friend Steve Williams uh, made this his best movie of 1991 when we did our best of the years for uh, We've Been Alive. Uh, so let's move this on to um, Steve Williams is, of course, uh, much more of a music fan than either of us and you've expressed how much of a music fan you are um so let's move on to the latest news from d23 disney's d23 expo earlier this weekend they rocked the internet once again with announcements of a black panther 2 release date may 6 2022 We'll see you then. Um, but the news that kind of shook people was that She-Hulk is getting a series on Disney+. Plus. We've, uh, we're have we constantly checking in with you, Garrett. Are you going to subscribe to Disney+. Plus? She-Hulk is getting a series. Well, I do have to admit that the the, the Disney Plus service does get more and more attractive uh, as as months go by. Uh, it, it at first I thought it was just going to be sort of a clearinghouse for their their old products, but now they really are uh, putting the weight and the muscle behind uh, uh, new content um, and, and drawing together the, all of the Disney properties under the umbrella, and it it is looking more and more attractive. Um, I I never read She Hulk as a as a comic, um, but you know I'm I'm interested to see what they're going to do with it. Um, uh, I I I know enough about the character and it's and her relation, of course, to uh, uh, to 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 He Hulk, I guess would be the the, the way to yeah. yeah Bruce Banner yeah the, the way to, to to distinguish them. Uh, so yeah, uh, I will be curious how that ties into the larger MCU. Um, uh, who, who they're going to cast? So uh, uh, color me intrigued, color me interested. Uh, and obviously, yeah, I mean, Black Panther 2, who isn't holding their breath for that, right? I mean, uh, there's the, the, the first one was uh, uh, so successful both uh, creatively and uh, financially. Um, uh, I, I almost am trying to sort of tamp down my anticipation because I, I almost sort of feel like they're not going to be able to capture lightning in a bottle twice. And somehow I'm inevitably going to be disappointed in the sequel. But I'm actually encouraged that they're taking their time with it. You know, uh, uh, 2022 shows that they're, they're not rushing it out. They're not you know, just trying to get another film out there and, and to cash in. Uh, they're, they're giving the creators time. To, 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 to create the film that they want to create, and I hope that that means that the, that patience will be rewarded with dividends. From one great franchise, incredibly successful franchise, the MCU, onto one of the other more successful franchises in the history of American film, Star Wars. Um, we got a trailer for The Mandalorian. That looks pretty pretty awesome um especially we've got warner herzog running around in the mandalorian wouldn't have suspected that but the new news is that somebody returns ewan mcgregor returns to play obi-wan kenobi in a disney plus series that is set in between uh episode three and episode four in his time on tatooine um what do we think i are you going to subscribe to Disney Plus now? <laughs> um, the the news that, there that makes me happiest is uh, is is getting in sort of an Obi Wan Kenobi not origin story because he's already pretty or originated by episode end of episode three. But uh, getting that gap filled in, I am curious what they're going to do. I liked Ewan McGregor as Obi Wan, and I think it also might address some of the, the the lingering concerns I have about both the Mandalorian and the teaser trailers that we've seen so far about episode nine. Uh, and that is, while they definitely look awesome in a lot of ways, uh, the, the most recent teaser trailer for Episode Nine is very clearly trying to sort of suggest that it's going to draw it all together, that, that it's sort of unifying uh, the original trilogy, um, and, and it's going to sort of try to tie the whole story together. But as I sit sort of reflecting back on where we are, uh, there's not a whole lot left that actually unifies the story when we leave off at the end of Episode Eight to the original trilogy. It's, sort of, it's starting to feel like you know, we're still in the same universe, but we're no longer telling, you know, the Skywalker saga at all anymore, as it were. You know, Skywalker is, Luke Skywalker is dead. Um, he's probably going to come back as a Force ghost, of course, but still, you know, I'm, 
I, I want to say, for the last Jedi. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, I, I want, of course, the, the, all this material to be great. I'm, I love star Wars uh, and I, I would love to, 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 to feel there's an organic unity going on here in in these trilogies. Um, but you know, for all the criticisms you can make of the original trilogy, the first trilogy, the first episodes one through three, uh, there felt like a very clear organic connection between that and, and, uh, episodes four through six. Uh, it felt like it was setting it up. I, I'm starting to feel like the, 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 the current trilogy, uh, 7 through 9, doesn't feel terribly grounded in the, the, the previous trilogy. It's not the worst thing in the world, but I do hope that, uh, that, that episode 9 ties that in together and makes it a little bit more organically whole. Um, and only time will tell if it actually, that it actually does. Did the latest trailer intrigue you more or less? Uh, are you more or less optimistic about episode nine after the latest trailer? I'm trying not to be optimistic, not because I, I necessarily think it's going to be poor, but yeah, I, I in some ways I think my disappointment with the previous two uh, Star Wars films originated somewhat out of the fact that I I wanted things out of the film that the film never intended or tried films never ever intended or tried to deliver, and that was my fault, not the film's fault. Uh, so I'm trying not to go into it with too much in the way of, of, of demands. Uh, of, I want this to be the, you know, a film. That I'm, I've, of course, I'm already betraying myself. Like I said, I want it to tie it in uh, with, with the other trilogies in a more right. organic way. But again, that, that, that's a hope. It's not a promise. I'm not, if it doesn't do that, it certainly doesn't, ne- doesn't mean that the film's necessarily going to fail. Um, but if it does go off in a different direction, I am glad that we are still going to be able to return to some of those original stories, uh, at least in the Obi-Wan story, if not also in The Mandalorian. Yeah, I'm I'm a little bit more nervous after seeing the latest episode nine trailer because the latest episode nine trailer is doing a whole lot of ray dark ray bullshit and I I think that is I I like if they're gonna do that, they better commit to that. And I don't trust JJ to commit to something that controversial, especially considering the type of backlash that any risk that Last Jedi took, uh, any risk that Last Jedi took was immediately met with a ton of backlash. And so I'm afraid that any sort of risky thing, like maybe Ray turns to the dark side kind of or, I mean, there's even a rumor that I saw that she's Darth Maul's daughter or some shit like that. Any of that stuff that they end up doing is so risky, and I don't see J.J. Abrams taking those risks. So w- what is a, a a worse outcome for you in your mind? That the sequence of her in the dark robe with the red lightsaber, the red du- double-edged lightsaber, that's just a dream sequence? Is that a worse outcome than they, they, they she she toys with the dark side but ultimately comes back to the light? What's I don't know. I don't the, the what we're getting at here is um, a fifty ha- percent ambivalence. That is to say that I don't I I want to know but also don't want to know. I just want to go experience the movie. I wish I never saw a trailer and I could just experience it without. Um, so 50% ambivalence and also 50% distrust of J.J. Abrams because he is, he's a remixer, right? He's not an, he's not an original artist. Um, and that's, uh, that's, I, I, that sounds harsher than I mean it to be, but he is not somebody who comes up with original ideas and then carries them through to fruition like Ryan Johnson, um, he is, uh, although Ryan Johnson's a bit of a remixer too, he is somebody who takes Steven Spielberg and makes Super 8. He's somebody who takes A New Hope and makes A Force Awakens. He's somebody who takes a magic box that he uh, got when he was a kid and turns it into Lost. Um, he's That is J.J. Abrams' modus operandi. So I, I can't really answer that question um, except to say that when I saw Ray flip the uh, the the lightsaber and it became a double edged um, red lightsaber, I think that's either she stole the lightsaber from somebody else, and then she's off to go f- and she lost her own or some shit, um, or it is it is 
it's a dream sequence. It's something. It's not as risky as the trailer makes it out to be. And if they were able to stick the landing on a Ray turns to the dark side story, if they were able to stick the landing on Ray turning to the dark side actually brings balance to the force and that like literal balance to the force where it's not just the good guys and the bad guys are, you know, the good guys have green lightsabers and blue lightsabers and the bad guys have red lightsabers, you know, because that is, that's the best part of Empire Strikes Back. It's that that which we believe to be evil is also part of us. That is why that twist works so fucking well and why that that movie is still the best of the Star Wars story. So if they're able to stick an Empire Strikes Back style um, kind of gray area of morality in The Rise of the Skywalkers, then I will five star the shit out of that movie. But I don't trust that that's what's going to happen. You, you you snuck the plural in there, which may not be mistaken, but technically speaking, it's rise of Skywalker, not Skywalkers. Um, well, right, but point. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah uh, I, uh, good point. I I'm thinking of my own uh, worst case scenarios of the plot of this movie, and okay. yeah. Um, one of the things I, I, I rather liked about episode eight was the sort of, I mean, I'm not sure moral ambiguity is the right phrase, but, but the attempt sort of in some ways to deconstruct the simplistic moral framework of the Star Wars universe. Yes. Uh, it, 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 that worked better in some parts of the film uh, than it did in others, uh, but I, I still liked the attempt. But yeah, that, that did seem to be pure Ryan Johnson, uh, not so much a J.J. Abrams kind of thing. I think J.J. Abrams does a great job of getting the hook. Uh, you know, I think Lost... Uh, uh, um, uh, Alias were, were, were both shows that did a really good job of getting you intrigued and getting you interested in wanting to find out what happens next. Um, but he doesn't have the best record of sort of uh, uh, of endings, uh, right. put it that way. Um, so yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have chosen him to direct the final uh, episode myself. But uh, I mean, there's no denying that you know he's 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 an expert behind the camera. His technical mastery is great. Um, I. Uh, uh, I'm curious. I really am. I, I again. I don't want to get my hopes up. I don't want to uh, be. Uh, I don't want to put too many of my own expectations, my own desires into it. So I'm gonna do my best sort of to take it on its own merits. Um, but I can't deny that I really want to come out of this one loving this one more more than the other two, um, and and feeling like it, it 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 is a satisfactory way of drawing this nine film core nine films uh, uh, to a close because that's something that. Uh, would be very, it's very, very difficult to pull off under any circumstances, but would be very, very rewarding if, it, if he manages to make it happen. I hope he does, too. We all want great movies. So, All right. Um, so that does it for this show. We're going to take next week off. Uh, we will return with more movie reviews and news. Until then, I'm Jim. And I'm Garrett. And this has been Jim, Jim and Garrett, Garrett at the Movies. Good night.